Hello, everyone. You are very, very welcome to this very special AgriKids Farm Safety Week webinar. A great big thank you to our very good friends in Flowgas for bringing us all together today. My name is Alma Jordan, and over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to be sharing with you some key tips on how everybody can remember how to be farm safe and to stay farm safe. This webinar is suitable for children aged 9 to 12 years. But remember, it's also for grown-ups too. So what kind of things are we going to be learning today? Well, we're going to learn a little bit about the do's and don'ts around farm machinery and some really key topics and some really key tips that can help all farmers stay that little bit safer when using the number one danger. Okay, we're going to learn about animals, what makes them happy, what makes them sad, how they tell us if they're in a good mood or tell us if they're in a bad mood. We're gonna learn that when we go around a farm, how to recognize some of the key hazards that could help prevent an accident. We're also going to know what kind of PPE, personal protective equipment, farmers use and wear daily in a bid to keep themselves safe. And woo we're gonna learn a little bit about slurry, what it is, where it goes, what it does, and why as farmers, we gotta be very, very careful whenever we are using it, okay? so. Why do we need to talk about farm safety? Well, I'm very sad to tell you that even though we're very good at farming and producing food in Ireland, when it comes to safety around it, we're not so good. And in fact, the farm is classified as one of the most dangerous workplaces in all of Ireland. So that's why I started AgriKids, because I wanted everybody of all ages to know and learn about farm safety. We've lost nearly 200 people over the last 10 years on our farms. And I want all of us to remember how to do that a little bit more in order to keep us that little bit safer. Okay, so without further ado, what can we do right now that's gonna make a huge, huge difference? Well, whenever we are visiting a, a farm, I always like to kind of know before I go some key things. Like number one, do I know the uh, different signs? Do I know why they're different colors? Why there's different pictures? what all that means. Well, that means something in particular. I also like to know before I go, my numbers. Okay, not me one, two, threes. No, my nine, nine, nines, my one, one, twos, and also things like my air code and my location code. So if there was an accident, then not only could I ring the emergency services using 999 or 112, but I would also be able to direct them to where they need to be, to the exact location where the accident is. And knowing things like your air code and your location code can help make that happen. Get those emergency services to you very, very quickly. Okay. But uh, when it comes to those signs, have you ever been to, to a farm and just at the gate, you see a big square sign that tells, you know, this is not a playground. This is a farmyard and they'll have like blue and red and yellow and green. Well, they're telling you exactly where the, the dangers are and the different colors are letting you know what level of, of a danger. For example, if it's a red sign, well, guys, that's a blanket no. No, 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 you can't go, okay? If it's green, though, that, that's a yes. That's a thumbs up, okay? You can go. When it's a blue, though, I like to wave the finger and be all bossy about this particular one. When it's blue, then you have to. It's mandatory. It's telling you what you have to wear, where you have to go. If you have to wash your hands, ringing any bells, and if it's yellow and black, well, that's that's a warning, okay? That's giving you a heads up for something to look out for, something to be mindful of. There might be, for example, working machinery. There might be, for example, an electric sign or an electric fence that's telling you, listen, watch out, okay? So that's why we've got different colors and different pictures, okay? All telling us something a little bit different, all right? But I, I like to really, when it comes to ongoing safety, having a tidy yard is absolutely key. My poor dad, one day, was taking some baling twine off a bale, and instead of wrapping it up and throwing it into the bag that he normally puts the baling twine, he threw it on the ground because he was distracted. He thinks he needed to, to, to do. And he went running off to look at something else on the farm that needed his attention. And when he came back, he was still kind of in a bit of a rush, in a bit of a hurry, and he was shuffling along, and he'd forgotten that he had dropped a roll of baling twine on the ground. He got tangled up in it and he fell over. He got quite a nasty fall. 
And when he recovered, he, he reminded me, Alma, when you're talking to all those children, make sure you remind them to keep a tidy yard and baling twine is something that needs to be put away so that doesn't happen. He was so angry with himself. It was such a simple mistake but could have been prevented so easily. So keeping a tidy yard, keeping trip hazards out of the way, falling hazards out of the way, keeping our tools neatly in our sheds, you know, uh, shovels, fork up against the, uh, the uh, wall. And whenever we're using ladders, try and have that second person with us with their foot on the bottom, keeping it grounded, keeping it level so we can use the ladder effectively, okay? And another big area I like to talk about is the whole area and chemicals on our farm. Do we leave them open so anybody can just go in and take what they want? Oh no, we gotta make sure we've got a proper chemical shed or a storage area and we always make sure we keep it locked. Now, what kind of things are we keeping inside that locked press? Well, we're keeping all our different pesticides and chemicals. And when it comes to pesticides, that's the collective term for all the different chemicals that we use. And you only really have to think of the first four letters, pest. For example, the one here on the bottom of the screen, that's a bit of a pest, isn't it? On a farm and in a house and anywhere really. Rats and mice eat our grain, eat, um, eat through kind of the wrapping on our baling. They do their poos and their wheeze, which leaves diseases around. So we don't want them around the yard, thank you very much. Okay, so we put down bait boxes and different rodenticides to keep them under control. Also, even if, if, if you're gardening or farming, you don't want your plants and your crops getting funguses and different diseases. So we use a fungicide. And to keep our animals well and healthy, we don't want flies and lice and fleas and all kinds of nasty things getting on them. So we use insecticides to keep them, to keep them well and healthy. And we always make sure when we are using insecticides, we protect our own hands and our own skin. That's very good for the skin of the you know, sheep and cows and everything else but they've got thicker skin than, than us. And we don't want that product getting into our skin. So by using like a nitrile glove, for example, is making sure we're creating enough of a barrier to prevent that product from seeping into our skin, okay? Also, the other kind of um, pesticide we like to use is a herbicide or a weed killer. And that's very good at making sure no weeds overpower or overcome a, a crop, taking all the nutrients that we want for our different crops, okay? But you know, to be honest with you, there are also aspects of our farm that we want the weeds to grow, that we want wildflowers such as dandelions to grow. Why might that be? Along with farmers who produce food, is there anything else that produces food? Ever heard of pollination and the pollinators like bees and butterflies and certain birds? Well, they feed off nectar and different pollens that we find inside lovely flowers. So we like to keep enough food for our pollinators so that they can take and eat the nectar and take that pollen and fertilize different trees and bushes. So we get our berries and our apples and our strawberries and all those lovely foods as well. So it's important that there's enough food for everybody. Okay, so we don't use weed killers all the time, just in certain areas to keep things under control but on our farm here we definitely like to keep a lot of wild flowers to to encourage our pollinators and when it comes to all these different chemical sites look around and see if you can recognize any of the warning signs where and how these different chemicals can be hazardous for example might they itch or irritate skin which is that one there if you breathe it in is it bad for you would it burn or corrode your skin not nice. Is it bad for the environment? You need to discard it properly. Or does it go on fire very easily? And is it just chemicals and pesticides around the farm? Mm -mm. Anybody ever do any dishwashing? Okay. If you even look on the back of some of the different products we use to keep our, our home clean, you might recognize some signs on the, on the back. This is great at cleaning dishes. We can still wash our dishes and eat our dinner off the uh, plates. But we need to make sure that they might irritate or itch our skin if it gets onto it. And you know, then you might have something like an oven cleaner, okay? Wonderful at cleaning ovens, or so I hear. I don't clean many ovens. But if we look there, we can see that it can actually be quite a hazardous product if we don't use it correctly. So warning signs are very useful. 
Okay, they're very good at telling us how to stay safe and how to mind ourselves, but they can be dangerous, which is why we always make sure we lock them away. So even if it's just detergent around your house, we keep them up high, especially away from young children. Okay. But there's one other chemical, one other kind of poison I want to talk to you about that's on our farm. And not only is slurry a poison, I'm sorry, a, um, a, has, a, has, a, has a poisonous thing in it, it's also a drowning hazard. Because what is slurry? Think about it. It's wee wee and it's poo poo, which is like a liquid, isn't it? So that could be a drowning hazard. Who's wee wee and who's poo poo, by the way, is a, is a slurry? It's mostly animal of course yeah cows yeah bulls yeah pigs absolutely chickens yep absolutely okay and why do we think farmers are keeping slurry on their farm especially if it's like a drowning hazard if there's something poisonous in, inside of it why are we keeping it well it's a brilliant fertilizer what's fertilizer helps things grow exactly it is absolutely we 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 look at slurry and see poo poo and wee wee Grass looks at slurry and sees well a big chocolate milkshake. It loves it. Grass grows green and lush and delicious. Animals eat the grass. They give us more slurry out the back, but we also get, they, they produce more milk. They produce more, more meat. So slurry is very important stuff. We've got to be super careful whenever we are working with it, okay? And it all comes down to what happens over the winter months. In winter, we don't spread slurry. We're not allowed, okay? Well, first of all, nothing grows anyway but also if that slurry was to freeze onto the surface a lot of rain it got washed into drinking water disaster not good okay so over the winter months pretend this bottle of cola is my slurry tank over the winter months all our animals are still doing their poo poos and their wee wees and all that poo and wee is gathering into tanks and pits okay and those tanks and pits fill up with all that wee wee and that poo poo and inside there is bugs and bacteria and do you know what they like eating? Wee wee and poo poo. And when they do that, they produce different gases. And one particular gas that they are producing is very toxic and very poisonous. It's called hydrogen sulfide. And at a very low level, that hydrogen sulfide will smell like rotten eggs. But at a very high level, woo, you wouldn't even know it's there. It takes away your sense of smell. And that's what makes it so dangerous. Okay? So over the winter, we don't spread it. But come summer, sorry, come spring, middle of January to the end of January, we are allowed to spread slurry once again, just in time to feed our grass, just as everything is getting ready to wake up and grow once again. So we can't just take it out. It's been sitting there for too long. So we need to mix it back together again. Okay, maybe add a bit of water in, you know, make it all nice and creamy so we can spread it all over our fields. Does anybody know what the process of mixing the slurry is, is called? Give you a tip it's written at the top of the screen agitation so we get our agitation which is like a big mixing spoon and we lower it into our tank and we start the agitation process and this is very very important because as we're doing this not only are we mixing all the wee and the poo together and getting all the nutrients circulated and distributed properly but at the same time we've woken something up we've set something free one big whoosh you are releasing three months worth of hydrogen sulfide which has been building and growing over the winter months okay and it's all released in one go so the first 30 minutes of agitation is considered the most dangerous so we make sure we are nowhere near that agitation point we are outside in the fresh air away as for uh, uh, as far as as we can to be honest and we stay out for at least an hour give that gas enough time to get up and blow away we make sure all the doors in our sheds are open so all the wind and ventilation can work properly and we never keep our animals inside that shed. We always take them out. We don't want hydrogen sulfide getting anywhere near our lovely animals, okay? But when that is all done and all our slurry has been agitated, the gas has been released, we can fill our slurry tanks and feed our grass. We can feed our animals. So slurry, it's good stuff, good for the animals, good for the grass. But is that good for you and me, especially if we don't use it correctly? Okay. What else do we need to look about out when it comes to our farms? Well, these guys. So we have signs that we can see and we can recognize. Okay. 
But animals will not wear a sign to say, you know, I bite, I kick, I'm in a bad mood. So we have to look at them and listen, okay? If we're looking, we're seeing, you know, what kind of behaviors are they demonstrating? Are they okay? It's like a dog wagging its tail wanting to uh, play. Or is it a cat going, okay, not good. Are they hissing? Are they growling? Are they bellowing? So look and listen to see what mood the animals can be in. Because trust me, they're very good at doing it. Geese and birds, for example, will lift their feathers, make and fluff everything out to make themselves look bigger and more threatening. Bulls will scrape the ground. Horses are very good at talking. They use their ears. When they're happy and interested, they'll prick them forward. If they twist them from side to side, it means that they're listening. If they're out to the side, well, they're, they're resting. They're, they're very relaxed. But when the ears are back, like in our picture here, is that a good sign? No, it is not. Very aggressive, okay? So this is why all our animals are very good at telling us how they feel. But we need to be the ones that know how to recognize. Okay, some of their behaviors is, is, is learned, things that they've picked up along the way, but some of it is instinct. Some of it is just automatic. It's, it's who they are and what they are. Okay, and two uh, animals in particular that we're going to meet very soon are very good when it comes to showing what their instinctive behaviors are. But if anybody has horses, by, by the way, it's very important to know that they have blind spots. And we never ever walk up behind a horse or cattle. They have the same blinds, the, the same blind spot. You walk up behind a horse, they can hear you, but they can't see you. And their instinct is to protect themselves against predators. And they will kick at any danger if they if they sense it coming up behind them. They it, it might be you coming with a bucket of food, but they don't know that. Their instinct is to kick the danger away. And cattle are the exact same. So when it comes to approaching horses, especially in the field, aim for their shoulder right here at the top of their front leg. Because that's where they can see you. Their eyes are on either side of their head. So they have very good vision on either side, but not good behind or directly in, in front, okay? So aim for the shoulder, give them every chance to see you and use your voice to let them know it's just you, all right? What about these, these guys? Here's a question. Look at these pictures. Do you think the bull is the most dangerous animal on our farm? He is big. I'll give him that. Yeah, he can, he can be. He can be grumpy. Yeah, absolutely. And what about the cow? Gives us milk. And what do we make with milk? Cheese, butter, yogurt, ice cream, milkshakes. Nice. What have I told you that she gives us lovely sweet foods? But sometimes she's not very sweet at all. In fact, it's her maternal instinct that has made a freshly calved cow the most dangerous animal on our farm, statistically speaking, okay? She's only been a protective mum, okay? In fact, all animals with their young are very protective. That's the maternal instinct, whether it's a dog, whether it's a sow, whether it's a ewe, it doesn't matter, okay? They will scrape or kick or puck or growl or bite or snap or snarl not because they're being mean, but because they're being very good mothers. So we've got to be super careful whenever we are working, especially with freshly calved cows. Make sure there's always a barrier between us and them, as Patrick is so wonderfully demonstrating here. If we're tagging the year, we put mum away, okay, and leave her there. But what we do, what we have to do, then we get out. And then we can release the, 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 the cow back to her, to her calf, okay? That's why it's important. We're very careful when working with freshly calved cows. She, she has been known to cause more accidents than a, a, a bull. But that's not to say Mr. Bull here is not grumpy. Oh, because he can be. And he's very good at letting us know what kind of mood he's in. And we're going to show a video very soon of a bull demonstrating just how they behave when they feel threatened in any way. And the reason why they might feel threatened is because, well, somebody has gone into their territory. So he's looked staring you down there he's gone into his field he's got a field of cows to mind that's his instinct that's his protective territorial nature to keep us safe around bulls we'll put a ring in their nose okay there's very sensitive area hang a rope hang a chain and he can learn how to be handled the thing is though i don't put that ring in no even granddad my granddad was a great man for our bulls and cattle never put a ring in your own bull's nose okay 
because if we don't do it right, we might hurt the bull. If you, if you hurt your bull or any animal, they won't like you, but they won't trust you. When you breach that trust, you're putting yourself into great danger. And I don't want to be in any great danger, especially when it comes to a bull. They're big, they're powerful and strong, okay? You don't want to be on his hit list, okay? Ever, ever, ever. But you know what? Let's see it for our, our, ourselves. And I want you to get, a, if you can, get a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil or a crayon or anything, or just use your mind. And with this video, we're going to look at a bull. And I want you to answer these three questions. What behaviors is this bull showing? Why do you think he's behaving like, like, like that? And is this instinct, is it something, is, is this an instinct of behavior or is it a learned be behavior? Has he, has he been taught to behave like this? Or is, it, is this just the way he is? Okay, so you go off and get yourself a pen and paper and I will get the screen ready. Okay, let's see him where he is. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, here he is. Okay, is everybody ready? Let's meet the Angus bull. think of him pretty pretty scary stuff no you know what he's doing a really good job of minding the herd of cows did you see them all he's doing a really good job of minding his his herd of cows one of them was even having to lie down look how relaxed she was that's how much she trusted him and he kept looking back at me did you notice that and bellowing all that and i have to say the guy who took that video was standing the far side of a fence. Okay, I checked that out. I also noticed though, what was missing from the bull's nose? Mm -hmm. That was taken in in America. Maybe the rules are different there. And he definitely should, he should have had a ring in his nose. But he was a good bull. He was just doing what his instinct was telling him to do. Okay. So what else do we need? To oh, yeah. Guys, you know when they say don't wear red around the bull? Do you think I'd have a red jacket? if it was dangerous to wear red around the bull. So, because that isn't true. Bulls, the bulls are colorblind, okay? They can't see red, they can't see blue, they can't see green. They really can see light colors, light shades, and that's fine, they don't mind them. What they don't like is movement, shaking, waving, going into their field, that annoys them. But I should also let you all know that a good friend of mine, Angus Mannion, always says to me, one time not to wear high vis around the farm, is when you're working with animals that mightn't be used to people walking through a field, because sometimes those reflectors or the high impact quality of a high vis vest can actually spook or startle a, 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 a herd. Okay, it's the only time I'll say not to wear your your, your high vis is around animals who might be that used to a, to a people, especially in a, in a large group. So I'll take it off if I'm walking through a field uh, checking stock, and um, so I, I don't want you to startle them. Okay. 
So the red thing, don't worry about that. Leave the high vis in the pocket when you're walking through a field of cows. That's what I do. All right. Now, what else do we have to talk about today? Well, with the animals, remember I spoke about the welfare and the well-being and everything else. Having good handling facilities is absolutely vital. I love this. And actually, I'll get my little annotation up here again, my little spotlight, so we can have a look at this. I love this, this here, okay? This is a really nice way for a vet to work, uh, especially with, with, with a pregnant cow, okay? They can easily access the, the cow, keeping her nice and calm, if that's nice and sturdy. This is brilliant, okay? This actually won an, an award in the Farmer's Journal, okay? Easy way to get animals in and out of the trailer, not going to run everywhere or scattering ev every, everywhere. Very, very simple. Over here, not so good. We got bale and twine holding things to together. This does not look like good, strong facilities. And these, these were shared with me by a vet to kind of show the good and the bad of some of the conditions that they have to work in, especially with animals. Keeping them relaxed and happy is absolutely vital and good handling facilities. That's the way to go, all right? And remember, it's summertime. You might be going to farms, petting farms. You might even be going to your friend's house. You might live in a housing estate and they have a green out the area. Zoonosis is always there when it comes to animals. And zoonosis is when a disease goes from an animal to a person. So that's why the whole hand washing thing is so, so important. Keeping our hands nice and clean to prevent the transfer of zoonotic diseases, such as ringworm and orf. Uh, cryptosporidium, leptospirosis, toxoplasmosis, okay? Um, leptospirosis, for example, would be like the wheel disease. So remember I spoke about the rats and the mice and everything else? Mm -hmm. Okay, so very, very important that we keep that all um, away because wheel disease can be a very, very serious infection, okay? A lot of those can be treated with over-the-counter products or might be anti antibiotics, but prevent them all to, to, together. Hand washing and hygiene. And nitrile gloves. Remember, I spoke about my nitrile glove. That's that's the way to go. All right. Um, and again, remember the animal care. Loads of food. Good, good, good shelter. Build that 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 trust. Okay. Making sure they have good access to veterinary care. If I can't do it, making sure the vet can actually do it. And how we handle our animals is key. And that starts from the from as early as you want. If you're even holding a little chick. Okay, their little bones are so fragile, they're so hollow. So making sure that you're handling them correctly so you don't hurt them at all. We don't want to hurt them, okay? Now, we're nearly, we're nearly, we're flying through all this, I have to say. But this, guys, is the number one danger. Tractors and machinery, okay? I can't explain and go on enough about how careful we have to be with tractors and, and machinery. And kind of from, you know, you know early, let's say, late April, we're doing hay and silage and everything else all the way through to September where the harvest and everything's going on and combines and everything. It's a very, very busy time and a lot of machinery is in action. So we've got to be smart. We've got to be clever to make sure we all stay nice and safe. When I was little, we had little tractors, okay? Like 50 horsepower, okay? The kind of tractors we have now are close to 250 to 70 horsepower, okay? Five times faster, more than five times faster and more powerful. So we've got to be all the more careful, okay? And something as simple, I, I love Farm Safety Hour on a, on a Thursday on a Twitter. Something as simple as keep, keeping our windows and mirrors clean and in, in, in check to make sure we're giving ourselves the best visibility because tractors nowadays have so many blind spots. We're up so high, okay? We have a great view directly in front of us. But as you get nearer, you've got blind spots and you can't see a thing. OK, it's important we are never, ever in the blind spot of moving machinery. We can't see you. We can't hear you. You shouldn't be there. OK, and these are the blind areas, all this red area, all around the back, the side, around the front. Can't see you. We can see great up and out, but not so good close. OK, so please, please make sure when tractors are in, in, in use, you are not approaching them ever. We can't see you, okay? And we don't want any accidents taking place. Let's be a passenger inside a tractor. In South Ireland, it's, it's, it's seven, okay? But you need your seatbelt and, a passenger, and um, a passenger seat for you. In England and the United Kingdom, it's 13 when you're allowed to be a passenger, okay? And again, you need your seat and your seatbelt. 
14, you can drive a tractor just around the farm. You have to have your, 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 your training done, okay? And at 16, you can drive it on the road with your license. And again, that all important training, okay? So I want you to do me a favor, all right? If you know of any farmers, do you please ask them if they have a seatbelt in their tract? And if they do, because I know not all tractors have them, please remind them to use it and to buckle up. We are immediately creating a survivable situation just by putting on our seatbelt, okay? Keeping ourselves safe and sound inside the cab of that tractor by buckling ourselves in, just like we do in a car every single time we get into it, okay? And all farmers, all right, all of them, we have Walter, Mark and Derek, very good at putting their uh, tractors on. Oh, hi, Walter, how are you? What you have to, to uh, say to us? Now, always think farm safety first and fasten your seatbelt and your tractor before you take off or do anything. Thank you, Walter. Appreciate that. Now, no. tractors again, though, all right? There's even, even simpler things that we can be doing to keep ourselves safe. So putting on our seatbelt is definitely one. And Farmer Mark here is great at reminding me how to get in and out of a tractor. We don't face forward when we're getting out. Okay, we fall. Okay, that's a high place to fall from. As you're coming down, as if you were coming down a ladder, we face back into where the seat is and we step down, okay? We keep those steps free of mud so we, 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 we don't slip. And on the floor of the cab, we make sure we keep no bottles or cans should ever be rolling around that floor in case they get lodged underneath a pedal or, or a brake. We can't use them. We keep it like a bag or a little box just to put our drinks and our cans into, oh, okay? Um, Simple, simple things, making sure, make sure, sure the handbrake is on and working. If there's anything broken on our, on our tractors, to fix them. They are, they are one of the most important pieces of machinery on our farms. And it's important we keep them right, fueled up, uh, serviced, oil, grease, fuelants, everything, coolants, everything in, in the engine working correctly. Okay, simple things. What else could, could, could be simple that we could do around a farm? Well, I love this. This is Farmer Mark again, okay? We all know what this machine is here, a tether or even a, a, a rake. And these little yellow things are tines. And what they do is, when that's out working like this, those tines are gathering the grass and shaking it out. So when we're making hay and, and, and a haylage, it's actually wilting. It's allowing us to shake and dry out the grass that's just been mowed so it can dry and wilt in the sun. So when it's being used, it's, it's like this and it's out and shaking. And when we're finished, using it we bring it in and we fold up the two ends like that so we're rising up the uh, times and the times that were down here are suddenly up here and some of them are eye level one day mark was rushing a bit like my poor dad with the bailing twine and as he was moving forward he slipped a little, little bit and he fell forward and times just went by the side of his head like that missing him he got such a fright that he said right can't let that happen. So he went off and he got some of the plastic wrapping that he was using for a bailing and tied it around those times that were eye level, immediately creating such a safe situation. How much did that cost? Pretty much nothing, okay? What difference would it make? Massive, immeasurable, okay? So always be thinking, what kind of things could, could we do to make things safer? A tidy yard, keeping things working, keeping things fixed, being nice to our animals, okay? All these hanging up our signs, all these little things make a huge, huge difference, okay? PTOs, you all know what a PTO is? Do you know what PTO stands for? Power takeoff. And what does a PTO do? Well, while you're thinking about that, let me pick one up, okay? I have one right, okay? Let me see, let me see. Now, hmm, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? Here's my PTO, okay? Now you see this little bit here in this picture right here? Yeah, well that's on the back of a tractor and I hook that in at the back of my tractor. And when I start my engine, that little shaft right there starts to twist and turn very, very fast. In fact, it's turning anywhere between nine and 16 times a second, okay? And that means when that starts twisting and turning, this bar that's now attached is turning at great speed. But that's very important because as soon as I turn on, on my tractor and attach my PTO, that's turning and twisting and bringing power 
the piece of equipment that I'm using. Maybe it's turning the header of the combine, maybe it's powering the hedge cutter or a mower, or even the tether and the rake that, that, that I spoke about. What other things are we, are we powering? It could be a dive feeder. It could be the agitator, mixing RS, RS slurry. So PTO is very, very important. If you see here and here, can anybody see the metal bar? No, you cannot. And you should never, ever be able to see that metal bar. We don't want anybody to see that, which is why we always make sure we keep it covered. Okay, and not only do we keep it covered, but we always make sure our safety chains are on also. Okay, and that locks this on the, on the outside. So everything, nothing can move here, but this can still move very, very freely. And that's key because as soon as, as, soon as I turn on that PTO and that bar is, is twisting, it's like a vacuum. It sucks in things around and it's turning at great speed. And if we don't cover it, we are at risk of entanglement, which is not always a survivable situation. I always think of my very good friend, Peter Gottery. Peter had a very, very serious accident involving an uncovered PTO. He'd had a rip in his overalls and a little piece of material at the tail was hanging off the overalls. And when he went out later that day with a son, Ryan, who, who was 10, they were going to feed cattle and they were hooking up the diet feeder. Peter's PTO that was attached from the dive feeder to the tractor didn't have its, its, its cover. And as they started the engine, a banging noise alerted Peter to the fact that maybe something was wrong near, near the PTO. So he left Ryan in the tractor and he went to have a closer look. Okay, remember, it was an uncovered PTO turning at great speed. And Peter had a little tail of material hanging off his trousers. When he went in to check what might be making that funny noise, he felt suddenly a pressure come down on top of him. He felt the pressure and then he was flipped to the far side of the uh, tractor. He'd become attached to the rotation PTO, which had flipped him. He broke his arm and broke his leg. Unfortunately, that wasn't the worst thing that happened to Peter on that particular day. Ryan in the tractor saw everything. Clever Ryan though, switched off the PTO. He knew where the emergency stop button was and he went to get help. Crucial, his mother is a nurse. And when she came, she could give very important first aid to Peter. Peter had broken his arm, broken his leg, but thankfully he was still alive. But unfortunately, he had lost something on that particular day. He lost his leg, okay? Peter has used his experience to talk to so many farmers and farm families all about farm safety. And he'll always say, if you have bad tools, you will do a bad job, okay, guys? Your pencil is broken. You can't write. You can't do your homework. You can't do the best job that you can possibly do. So fix your pencil. If my PTO is broken, smashed, not maintained, I replace it. I always want to do the best job that I can possibly do. And I always thank Peter for allowing me to share his story whenever I'm talking to um, boys and girls and families. Okay, thanks, Peter. Now, nearly there. Quad safety. Hugely important. And guys, in November 2023, the rules are changing. Anybody who uses and operates quads will have to wear a helmet and undergo uh, training, QQI um, accredited training, in order to be allowed to use their quad bikes. Okay, this is hugely important. And it's why I always turn to my friend Noel Dynan, the CBT group, when it comes to the whole area of quad safety, because he always is great at sending me pictures on what to wear and how to behave when operating a quad bike, okay? So no, what do we wear? Well, you can say the helmet, absolutely vital. Okay, I have one, huge, nice light one, but look, very, very solid, okay? Put it on, put on your chin strap. That's like a windshield, keeps away flies and, and dust and everything else, okay? What else has no got on? else he has his sunglasses it could be sunny all right protect your eyes from the from the glare so, so you can drive it long sleeves long trouser legs help protect you against scratches and scrapes and everything else that might be there and um, gloves i like these ones in the winter they're nice and warm but also I have, a nice, I have a nice grip panel there as well so make sure i've got good good grip and nice warm hands because you're very frosty in those early mornings. Okay, speaking about grip, good boots, good
good foams on the boots because there's a lot of muck and water. So I like to make sure I have plenty of grip when I'm getting on and off my, my, uh, my uh, bike, okay? Now, no will also say there's one seat. Therefore, only one user, one person on a quad at any one time, okay? I know that seat is long. You think, but there's plenty of room for me. We need that, that room. That room is to allow us to move forward and back so we can shift our weight and keep the bike balanced. I can move forward up a hill, move back coming down via hill, okay? If you don't keep something balanced, it rocks and it can fall over, okay? And that's why we have overturning happening on quad bikes when it hasn't been kept balanced, okay? A good way of making sure it always stays balanced and making sure there is no passengers. If I have somebody sitting on the quad, I can't move forward, I can't move back. The bike won't be balanced, so it could rock and turn over, okay? And we don't want that to, to happen, okay? So remember, there's one seat for one user, all right? Um, and finally, guys, the last thing I want to talk about, and this kind of, this is kind of for everybody, okay? Farmer well-being, okay? And we, we talk about how they can keep themselves well to make sure, you know, we can con continue to providing food and doing the job that we do. But this is kind of for everybody because we all need to remember when it comes to the likes of weather, how to keep ourselves safe, that we eat good food. Farmers produce great food. In fact, we produce enough food to feed like 50 million people every single year. So let's make sure we are eating some of that great food that we produce and getting as much rest as we possibly can, especially at those busy, busy times, okay? In the weather, when it's sunny, what do we need to protect our, ourselves? Sun cream, okay? Absolutely, skin cancer is the most common cancer in Ireland. So easily pre prevented by wearing an SPF, a hat, wrap around sunglasses. Remember, keeping ourselves hydrated, plenty of water. Okay, and when there is plenty of water, like falling from the via sky, keeping ourselves free of colds and sniffles and chills, my boots, waterproof uh, overalls, and of course a hat, keep the rain off our, our heads. Okay, now diet, don't get me, me wrong. I love sweets. I love them. It's fun food Friday in our house. Okay, I love it. But they don't have the nutrients that you need to nourish your body and to help you grow and develop and to think and to move and to do all those things we all love to uh, do. So a good rule of thumb is to follow the uh, pyramid. And right here at the top of the pyramid is the tiniest tip. That's the amount of goodies, the processed high sugary foods that they recommend that we can have. Not every day, just a little bit, okay? Starting down here though, the other five parts of the food pyra pyramid is pretty good, okay? Loads of fruit and vegetables, okay? Get your cereals and grains and your whole wheats into your potatoes. Then we have our, then we have our dairy, our cheeses, our, our milks. Okay, good for our bones, calcium. Our proteins are there, our beans, our lentils, our eggs, our fish, our meat. Good for us. And here then are our oils. Okay, and again, small, small amounts, but they're, but they're good fats. Okay. And if you look here at the fruits and the veg and the, the cereals and grains and the dairy and the meat and the lentils and all these, these oils and butters, where did they all start from? Where do they co come about? They all started on a farm. And the thing is, it doesn't matter what you eat or how you eat, you're gonna need, you're gonna need a farmer for that, okay? So next time you're in a supermarket, have a look at all the different foods and see if you can work out where they started from, okay? And when you're having your dinner, remember the rainbow. The more color, the better. Think of nice tomatoes, red tomatoes, yellow peppers, green broccoli. Not great on broccoli. I prefer, let me see, a cabbage. Yeah, peas, salads. There's always an alternative, okay? So remember the, uh, the uh, rainbow and fill your plate with color and nutrition, okay? And at the end of a long day, guys, get some rest, okay? Nobody likes looking like this. And when you look like this, then you're not able to do this or this, definitely not this. At our busy, busy times, it's so important that we get as much rest as we possibly can so that we can perform and do the best that we can. This is a, the harvest time is a very, very busy time on our farm. Long hours, hard hours, hot and dusty. We've got to make sure we get rest when we do and have help when we can, okay? I don't always look like this, 
but this is what, what I aim for, okay? Less of this, more of this. If there's something that you see that you don't think is right, don't be afraid to speak up and say it. Because by doing that, you could be helping to prevent an accident and indeed you could be helping to save a life. So I want to wish you all a very happy summer, a very happy Farm Safety Week and beyond. And remember, no matter what, to always be farm safe and to stay farm safe. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.